have members that are certified and will be glad to step up to the plate and help fulfill these uh, vacancies. The next thing is there's some federal grant money that will be coming up available next year for the possibility of us doing a training center. I've been pursuing this grant for several years now and I don't know how far we'll get, but I am gonna apply for the grant. But we would have to have somewhere to put that building and we have, might have to have some matching money to the tune of 5% with that. So I don't know how far that'd go, but I will apply for that grant. Uh, anything we can do to upgrade the health and safety and welfare of our firefighters and get them better trained, as well as our EMS and working with the Sheriff's Department will be a good thing. And the county has the property at, at, at the old prison. There would be an excellent place for that. But we continue to look forward to your support and we continue to uh, give our time to help our county that we so do love and the citizens therein. And uh, it's nice to have the communication center back up and going. Thank you. Next is Ms. Emily Truman. Thank you and meeting time. Um, first off, just on behalf of the dispatchers, we wanted to say thank you to Commissioners Craddock and Freeman for helping us out with some chairs and dispatch as our chairs broke a couple weeks ago, and then also to EM1 for getting those chairs replaced. I know that's been brought up at lots of different meetings, um, but we did have some that we were able to borrow, and then we've had new ones come in since then, so we do appreciate that. Um, the only other major thing, really, is the meeting times, which I was very excited to see on the agenda this month. Um, I've heard from many others they were very excited. Um, and we're very hopeful that you will take into consideration the requests that have been being made for months now to move the meeting times back to the 6.30 time slot. Um, as many people do have to take off early from work if they wanna be here. Um, I think that's true possibly for even some of the commissioners sitting here that they have to leave early in order to be here. Um, so we just ask that you please consider that. Uh, the attendance the last few months I think has been a good thing and I feel like it could be more um, should the meeting times be more appropriate. Um, and then the last thing was, as we move forward with what has been known as COVID money, um, just ask that you please consider the true infrastructure as you're going forward with the plans for those funds. Um, the water system, the fire hydrants, 911, all things have been mentioned before. Um, I had the opportunity to go meet with one of the fire departments in the county recently, within the past couple weeks, and was told that they actually have a fire hydrant that is out of service um, in a couple areas of their district. Um, and that's concerning because water hall then becomes a requirement and sometimes that makes things more difficult. So as you move forward and considering those things, I do ask that you please listen to the pleas of your first responders and to the pleas of your citizens um, and how to handle the use of that money. So thank you. Last speaker is Anthony Sanders, housing. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say to the board, thank you uh, to our county attorney and our, and our county manager. What if your roof leaked every time it rained? What if the sheetrock in your house fell on you, in your living room, in your kitchen, and in your bedroom? What if your toilet never flushes and you have to plunge it every time you get ready to use it? What if you smell mold and mildew in your home all the time? What if your wood stove was so holy that the ashes from the stove would fall on the floor would possibly set your house on fire? Roaches, mice, all in your cabinets. These were just a few of the conditions that for four families here in Gates County lived through for a long period of time. When these families came to the housing committee for help, I knew that day that, that, I knew the day that I condemned those three of those four homes, that a replacement was the only answer for these families and the journey began. The board of commissioners and the housing committee worked hard for a while to make this project work. So tonight I say thank you to all of the housing committee members 
to the county attorney, county manager, and all of the board of commissioners who kept this project moving in a positive way. Commissioners continue to continue to move the county forward in a positive way. Soon we will see, hopefully, a Hardee's, McDonald's, Burger King, CVS, Walgreens in Gates County, just like they are in our surrounding counties. I would like to say and give a special thanks to the late Reverend Dr. Henry Jordan. He kept us lifted up from the lifted up from the board of commissioners when we really felt sometimes this day would never come. Board, you guys and the housing committee have made a have made the quality of life better for four families here in the county. And that's a good that's a good feeling. Keep up the good work and stay positive. Work for the county and continue to move on. And for those who don't really know exactly what I'm talking about, there's four families who have their homes have been demolished in the last couple of weeks and their new modular homes are coming in. Hopefully these families will be in their homes in the next couple of weeks, three at the most. So it's, it's, it's a good feeling uh, when you know you have helped somebody, especially to make the quality of life better. So again, I say thank you to you guys. I know sometimes you got frustrated at us as, as a housing board. Uh, thank Reba Holly for taking the leadership and helping push this with you guys. So again, I say thank you. Continue the good work that you're doing here in the county. Thank you. That's the last speaker. That's the last speaker. Now we'll uh, hear from the uh, Mr. Tim Lyons with Malden and Jenkins LLC. We'll do the audit presentation. You may approach. And you heard that we amended the agenda so that when uh, you finish your presentation, we'll discuss the contract. Yeah, that sounds great. And I figured because I heard that the NCDOT is not coming, I can just take their time too, right? <laughs> we'll be up here for a couple hours and we'll run through that. Um, appreciate y'all having me here tonight. Um, for a little levity, I heard the guys down there talking about March Madness or something. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, everybody's got somewhere to be. Um, so what I've got here is a... We need to take a recess for a couple of minutes so he can pull that up and, and turn it around. Okay. I apologize. No, no, that's My fine. IT person wants to. Let's take a two-minute recess. <laughs> Do in a minute and a half. <laughs> He's going to move that. You okay. I tell you what, I'm glad you're not. <laughs> you see, OT can be. It's interesting or something. 50%. 50%. And then half. Commissioners, you have a copy of this pre presentation at your seats. And the contract is, should be in new business. Back in session, Mr. Malden, Mr. Lyon, excuse me. So what you all have in front of you is a, is a hard copy printout of what's on the screen here. Just a few kind of PowerPoint slides to, to in essence, to go over uh, the results of the county's fiscal year ending June 30, 2021 uh, financial and compliance audit. So um, as it says on the inside of that first page there that says agenda, um, it's really just we'll go quickly over the engagement team, uh, the results of the audit. We've got a few slides on some financial ratios and trends that we typically like to talk about, and then some comments, recommendations, and then certainly if y'all have any questions, um, I got a slide at the end for that. And certainly if as I'm going, if y'all have any questions, feel free to uh, to stop me there. But um, that the next slide there about the engagement team, I include this in here just to point out that you know this is. 
when we conduct an audit, um, there's a minimum of two partners uh, at our firm that are involved with every single audit. And I, I served as the engagement partner, so ultimately I'm the one responsible for the county's audit, signing the reports and those things. And then James Bentz, um, who is a, a, another partner in our governmental practice, serves the role of en engagement quality control review. And basically, he's not involved in the audit at all. When we finish, myself and the other members of the team get finished, we send this whole report and file over to James and have him look, do a completely independent review. So we really, um, you know, engagement quality is very important to us. I mean, we know we have, you know, high ethical standards we have to follow as the independent CPAs. But just in our own governmental practice, this is very important because we do uh, spend a lot of time working with governments throughout the year and we take it very seriously so um, those that was your engagement team for the for the 2021 audit on the next page there we have the results of the audit and you know the, the highlights from this slide really kind of starts with that second main bullet point that says report on the 2021 basic financial statements you know the most important thing is what sort of opinion did we render on the financial statements so we issued an unmodified or a clean opinion on the county's financial statements there is no uh, higher or better opinion that you can get unmodified is a uh, fancy accounting auditing term for clean so um, so clean opinion on the financial statements which is uh, which is the most important part um, the next couple of slides that we have um, what what this these are known as what are called the required communications so these are the things that we uh, as your independent CPA have to submit to those charged with governance we have to submit them to you in writing which which I have done and so I don't plan to go through and read every single one of these. I think there are a few of these that are important to point out, so I'll touch on those briefly. Uh, underneath that first bullet point where it says significant accounting policies, the fourth item down, it talks about um, the implementation of a new accounting standard. So if you do, if you have the county's financial report, if you ever kind of do a side-by-side -side and flip and just see what changed, how did things change from year to year, you will notice that in the past we had pages in there for what were known as agency funds, where the county is essentially kind of acting as a pass-through. Um, now those are called fiduciary funds or custodial funds. So they do look a little bit different, but that was brought about by a new accounting standard, a GASB statement number 84. So that is a, uh, a new statement that we had to implement in the, uh, in the 2021 uh, financial statements. On that next page, the second bullet point there that says relationship with management, we received full cooperation from the county's management and staff. I always like to touch on this. I mean, what does that mean? We were uh, hanging out, you know, going out for drinks afterwards. That's not what that means. Full cooperation <laughs> means when we, when we conduct an audit, we ask for a lot of documentation, access to records, uh, access to individuals in different departments and what have you. Full cooperation means that we, those things were given to us without any sort of issues. We were not, we didn't feel like we had any, you know, point in time where we were having things withheld from us. We didn't have any difficulty getting access to people or systems or what have you. So, um, full cooperation from management, I think, is important to point out. And also, I just would take a, a second to say that I appreciate all of uh, Kim's hard work during the audit. Again, working through the challenges of COVID, we did the majority of the audit remotely again. Uh, it was difficult, um, as it has been for a couple of years with all that, but appreciate all of Kim and uh, her team's uh, hard work to do that. Um, the next bullet point there, audit adjustments. I always think it's important to point out that second hash mark there that says there were no unrecorded adjustments. Sometimes when we conduct an audit, we can identify a difference or an adjustment and maybe end up, we decide for one reason or another not to post it. It's not considered immaterial or something like that. We didn't have any of those this year. So no unrecorded adjustments. Everything is considered uh, that we identified uh, has been included in the county's financial statements. And then last, the last required communication there, the bottom one that says auditor independence on the, on the next page. I um, always like to touch on this just to remind folks, we, we have to be completely independent of the county in order to conduct an audit and render an opinion on the county's financial statements. Not only do we have to be independent in accordance with our ethical standards, with our, which is set by the American Institute of CPAs, but in accordance with government auditing standards because we are auditing federal and state awards, which are even more stringent than our uh, professional standards. So have to be independent uh, of the county in order to render an opinion. The next couple of slides we have talk just a little bit about some financial ratios. Um, fund balance in the general fund, obviously very important, something that everybody wants to talk about and look at. Uh, at the end of the county's fiscal year that ended June 30, 2021, uh, unassigned fund balance was about 39% of annual expenditures. So how does that rank us compared to uh, other counties of similar size, which you can see a similar counties in North Carolina, we're kind of right on par with what other counties of similar size are. Um, the GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, 
uh, they recommend uh, kind of their benchmark would be between 60 and, and if I've seen 60 and 90, 60 and 120 days, but either way, the county's unassigned fund balance and the general fund is in a, is in a good position there at June 30, 2021. So um, that's, a, that's a good thing to see. And you can see we've seen over the last four years how that fund balance has trended up and trended into uh, where it is or where it was at June 30th of 2021. The, the next slide is um, just some tax revenue per capita, <clears throat> just kind of looking broadly at uh, taxes and how uh, it fares per capita, especially when compared to, again, other counties in the state, I think is a relevant, uh, relative, a relevant comparison. Um, $642 per person about um, when you look at the total tax revenues by, divided by the county's population. The smallest 20 counties in the state, which uh, would be where Gates would fall, um, about $725 a person versus statewide, if we look at every single county, about $737 per person. So you can see where that the tax burden per person or per capita in Gates County is uh, a little bit below those averages, but certainly uh, not, not significantly out of whack or anything like that. Um, the next slide, looking at the general fund's budget. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing to take away when we looked at the general fund for the year, the final budget uh, reflected a uh, anticipated addition to fund balance. So uh, uh, where we're going to put some money in reserve to call it that was about $550,000. And for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021, the county added about $1.9 million to fund balance um, for the fiscal year. So again, that kind of, kind of um, fit, fits in with that other chart that shows fund balance kind of continually growing the last four years. I mean, when we started working with the county uh, four years ago, uh, fund balance was fairly low and we've seen it kind of continue to, to trend in the right direction in the last few years. Um, the biggest significant revenues in excess of budget, sales taxes, which is a pretty common trend we see across most of our counties in the state the last couple of years. Uh, there were, especially at when, when COVID hit, there was a lot of warnings about, we don't know what this is going to happen. And pretty consistently across the board, we've seen sales tax revenues and ABC revenues continue <laughs> to go up. So everybody went home and drank and online shopped is basically <laughs> what happened when the pandemic happened. So um, the next slide. Um, is just the county, looking at the county's two enterprise funds, the landfill fund and the water fund. You know, these funds, the, the basis of accounting is a little bit different with these funds than, than, than with the general fund. We're on the full accrual basis of accounting. So a lot of times it's more important to look at cash flows. Uh, that's kind of with, with, with business type activities like the landfill and the water fund. We're looking at these more like a private sector business and we're looking at cash flows. And both funds had positive cash flows from operations this year. Um, and while the water fund had a, a decrease in net position for the year, so uh, you know a net decrease in equity, if you want to look at it that way, of about four hundred thousand dollars. Important to consider there is about three hundred thousand of it was depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. That's where we're, we're recording that the annual depreciation on the assets used in the water system. So <clears throat> overall, both funds at the end of the year um, have a a positive balance <coughs> in unrestricted net position. So. Uh, again, no, no significant deficits. We're not, you know, we're not operating at a significant operating loss, or we're not using, we're not, no consumption of cash in operations. Those are the main things you, you're, you're looking for when you're looking at the <coughs> enterprise funds. The next slide talks a little bit about our single audit engagement. Uh, essentially, what, what this is, is as a part of the county's annual audit, we also have to look at the grants, uh, look at different grant activity. Um, this year we had, to, we had to audit two major federal programs. We did not have any state single audits to do. The county's total state expenditures uh, for grant programs did not exceed the threshold uh, for having to have any grants audited. The two major programs, Medicaid, this is required to be tested annually. annually we have to test this. The, the State Department uh, of DHHS in the state requires we test this. And then the coronavirus relief funds or uh, the CARES Act money. This is different and this is not the uh, ARPA or CSL, FRF, depending upon what y'all are calling that. This is not, it's not what this is. County didn't spend any of that money last year. This is the coronavirus relief funds that were received in the previous year. So we had to audit both of those. We had um, no, no findings, uh, no issues with internal controls over compliance. So a, a clean opinion uh, on the single audit as well. The next couple of slides are, are really just some uh, recommendations. We, we, we call these management recommendations or management points. Uh, these are items that came up during the audit that we just feel like are important to point out, talk about with management. Uh, this first one has to do with the financial reporting process. And what we've talked about with Kim is that while the county's finance department is small, relatively speaking, and we're not talking about a big you know, multi-department decentralized operation, 
but a lot of the um, a lot of the process for uh, doing financial close and closing out the year is not written down, documented, well, uh, well documented. And, and the idea there would be that if something were to happen, having somebody that can step in and kind of perform those procedures, having a, a well documented process for financial close, for year end wrap up, and all those types of things. So just a recommendation that we would we would take some time and put put some pen to paper there and come up with a, a, a written out process for that financial closeout process. The next uh, management point that we have, we've, we, we consider this sort of an industry uh, recommendation. This is something that we, we talk about with a lot of our clients. This does not mean that we uh, did any sort of in-depth IT testing or identified any significant issues or what have you, but uh, we do know that unfortunately uh, IT systems can be hacked for a long time. Uh, it was governments of uh, fairly large sizes, but now we're seeing it happen to governments of all sizes. And so just a recommendation that we, especially as we continue to move into this environment where more is being done remotely, more things are being done in the clouds, uh, more devices are being connected to our network, all those types of things that we just consider cybersecurity risk management and all of the decisions that we're making and make sure that we're paying attention to it uh, because of the risks that are uh, present uh, in the environment nowadays. Uh, the last slide that I have with, with information on it really just has to do with <clears throat> a couple of slides on things that are happening right now. We have a new, couple of new accounting standards we'll be implementing in the next couple of years. Um, I was meeting with Kim earlier talking about this first one here about GASB 87, which is leases. Um, I could stand up here and talk about uh, technical accounting things for a while, but you all don't want me to do that. So I'll just say that we are aware of those things and working with the county to make sure we get them implemented correctly. We know that on the next slide, there's still a ton going on at the federal level uh, related to COVID, all the different funding streams, all the different things that we're seeing out there. Um, you know, we've, Kim and I have talked through a couple of these things today as well and just making sure that we're paying attention to all the things that continue to happen. The LGC has done a pretty good job of trying to keep everybody informed and up to speed on all the different uh, issues that have popped up with related to all these different funding streams that have come out from the federal government uh, since the beginning of COVID. And then last but not least, just to remind you all that we do uh, free quarterly continuing education for all of our governmental clients. Um, certainly if any of y'all uh, want to be on that email distribution list, just get, uh, get your email address to Kim and she can get it to me and I'll make sure that y'all um, receive the communications on there. And so with that, I am happy to take any questions that you all have. Any of the commissioners have any questions for Tim? No, I would just say this is the best presentation I've had in oh, my well. years as county commissioner. It's very clear and understandable. Most of the time it's not. Thank, Thank you. you. Well presented. Thank you. Uh, I have one question when you were talking about uh, um, management recommendations yeah. over there. And you said uh, something about um, doc documentation and uh, like a close out mm -hmm. and things like that. Is there a template that you could provide to us that, sure. would, that would benefit? Yeah, we, I mean, one of the things that we have, we provide at the beginning of the audit, this, this, these documents that are called internal control questionnaires. Um, Kim probably loves having to get them and review them and fill them out. They're, they're, they're kind of cumbersome, but they do, those include a lot of uh, examples of controls that you would want to see in the financial close out wrap up year end process. And then beyond that, I know um, the GFOA, the Government Finance Officer Association, they've got a bunch of best practices, toolkits, what have you, so can certainly provide, um, you know, Kim, recommendations on any of those type things to kind of base it on. Okay. Um, the biggest thing with that we would talk, make sure we talk through is with a small finance department, we want to continue to maintain segregation of duties. And so that's the biggest challenge with a small finance department. We want to make sure that we don't allow any significant controls that, to be performed by one person, you know, where... You could have control of a transaction from beginning to end. That's the biggest challenge with the small finance department is making sure that if, you know, as best you can, mitigating controls, putting those in place, and making sure that we get others involved as we need to. But, but we can work with Kim on that for sure. Okay. And then the uh, other question that I had is on the free. Yes, sir. Quarterly continuing education. Yes, sir. Um, and so I just just briefly looked, looked over that. And it does say locations on there. So... Um, is, are you actually doing it the location or are you Zoom? We're doing it all Zoom right now. Everything we've been doing, we've been, it's been all virtual since the second quarter of 2020. Um, and it's, it's funny you bring that up. We've, we've had conversations before about do we want to go back to doing it in person, but we've, the attendance has been so much greater <laughs> doing it over Zoom that we probably will continue to offer at least once per quarter 
uh, free, continually continue to do it virtually, where we have access to it either over Zoom or some other online platform. Um, Madam Chair, I would I would make sure that county county managers see that back page there. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to segue into the contract, Kim. I know you're in here. If you, uh, Commission, if you turn to your packet, you will see a memorandum uh, prepared by uh, our finance officer, Kim Outland, about Gates County three-year audit contract has ended as of the FY21 audit. Okay. Have y'all read that? Mm -hmm. Okay. It states that uh, for, the, for the audience, LLC has provided wonderful services to Gates County over the past three years. I have worked with them. If I have ever needed an answer to a financial question, they have always been very prompt and informative. They were instrumental in assisting us doing all the necessary cleanup after the software conversion in 2018. I have attached a three-year cost proposal to extend our contract with Malden and Jenkins LLC for the board to review. My recommendation would be to continue with this company as outlined in the proposal. Action needed once we have reviewed it. The board needs to make a motion and vote on the approval or denial of the extension of the contract with Malden and Jenkins to provide audit services for Gates County for an additional three years. I make a motion that we approve the contract for an additional three years. And I'll second that motion. Very good job. It's been properly motioned and seconded that we continue to cut three-year contract with Malden and Jen Jenkins. All in favor? Aye. Uh, it's unanimous. Thank you, Tim. We'll see you again. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> now we'll have two presentations back to back. The first will be the housing submitted by Ms. Reba Green Holly. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. First, I'd like to do the housing report. I'd like to thank the commissioners for the support that you give the housing committee. And uh, for those who don't know, the housing committee is here to assist with elderly, disabled, low income and or veterans to help them with health and safety issues in their home that will help them stay in their homes much longer which eventually addresses us as taxpayers saving dollars on Medicaid if they have to go into assisted living. And this committee was started years ago out of the need DSS saw, Department of Social Services here in the county, with housing standards and safety issues with its citizens. Uh, we are a 501c3. And we are a committee made up of people here in the county. And I think some of them are in the audience, but just so you'll know who's on this committee. And if they're here, if they'll please stand. I know some are virtual. We have Rita Blair with EIC, Joan Bond representing the community, MacArthur Brick Faith Organization, Shakira Jordan with EIC, Myself, New Middle Swamp Baptist Church Representative Shirley Johnson and Valerie Riddick, Gates County Transportation um, System, Patrice Lassiter, Dr. Althea Riddick is uh, representing the commissioners, Anthony Saunders representing the community, and Willie Smith representing Department of Social Services. And we do welcome any other people in the community who would like to be on this committee. Our report for 21-22, even though COVID has impacted us for the last couple of years, we were able to um, reach 13, we received 13 housing repair requests. And out of that, two were not qualified for service. Four were referred to state grant for funds that Burnett and Associates had. One was referred to EIC, 
two tarps were installed on a roof, two roof repairs were done, two were referred to the Roanoke Electric Upgrade to Save program, and one was referred to independent living. Even though COVID has impacted us, we are still getting requests for assistance. Uh, we've served uh, as a sounding board for the clients who had complaints concerning the status of the replacement grant uh, because we were the committee that identified the four um, individuals who qualified for that repl those replacement homes and when uh, those funds were received, they didn't have to go searching for people. They were already on a wait list for any funding that came in. So quite naturally, anytime they were trying to find out information, they were coming to us to find out uh, for them. And I, we're glad to hear that the progress has moved forward on those four homes because they are elderly individuals and we were just hoping they get to get in those homes before anything happened. We also have secured two volunteers to assist with small home repairs and we collaborate with Roanoke Electric with their Upgrade to Save and Solar Share program that works with trying to help with energy efficiency and helping since in our area 50% or more of the homes are substandard. Uh, we receive church donations and also we have been meeting and developed a comprehensive marketing and branding plan to increase awareness of housing assistance here in the county. We have gone live with a web page, which is gchousingcomm.org. And we also have resources listed on that website for people who might need additional housing information. Our application is listed there that you can pull off and uh, you can either fill it out online and then print it off and send it to us or you can print it off and fill it out by hand. It lists all the members and our mission on that website. Um, we also are in the process of having PayPal and Amazon Smile set up so donations can come in. We meet monthly the third Monday from 1 to 2 via Zoom. Currently, we were in person before COVID. Um, and then uh, I think the members, uh, Ms. Chestnut has a list of the members attached to the report that I gave her. And um, I think that concludes my report for housing. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Ms. Holly? Okay. Okay. I think that uh, the website has that report. I hope. Uh, I if will not, put we'll it, put it. Up. I will put it up. There. I want to put that on the website. And while I'm thinking about it, we're also going to post the audit that uh, Mr. Lyons went through. We can put that on the website. So if you want to go back and look at it, uh, it'll be available to the citizens. Okay. All right. Now I would like to move into the Rosenwald School. Um, presentation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to update you on the Rosenwald School activities in Gates County. And I'll start with a brief explanation of the Rosenwald Schools. There are four key aspects to Rosenwald School movement and legacy. The Rosenwald Schools held a special place in history and rep represented a landmark in the history of African-American education. The Rosenwald School construction project began in response to the lack of adequate schools for African-American children in the rural South that followed key historic and antecedent events such as the Civil War and the abolishment of slavery in 1865 and the 1896 landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision in Plessy versus Ferguson that declared separate but equal facilities did not violate the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. The second key aspect is North Carolina lacked a uniform system for state-supported education 
and adequate schools for the education of African American children and were lacking and they were lacking in the rural south. The Rosenwald School Project was the first major movement committed to advancing the cause of education on behalf of African American children in rural south. The value of an education, this is the third point, was shared by African American leaders and families. The national leader, Booker T. Washington, called upon wealthy Northern philanthropists such as Julius Rosenwald, president of Sears and Roebuck Company, to donate funds for the building of schools for African American children in rural South. As a result, the Rosenwald Fund was established in 1917 for the well-being of mankind. The fund called for public-private partnerships and required that members of the local white and black communities collaborate and raise money to qualify for matching funds. Principles of personal and, of personnel and shared, personal and shared responsibility for the betterment of the race and mankind and the belief education was critical to self-sufficiency and preparing individuals for work and productive roles in society where we're embedded in the Rosenwald School movement. The fourth bullet is even though the Rosenwald schools were conceived in response to an epic time in history and to address or correct the unequal status of education and schools for African American children in the rural South, by virtue of changes in history, they are also they also eventually became identified with the negativity of segregation. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education declared separate but equal schools were unconstitutional. Most Rosenwald schools have fallen prey to age and neglect. However, both the physical structure and the historical heritage of Rosenwald schools must be restored and preserved or we risk losing an important part of our history. Carrie Pittman was credited for building 28 Rosenwald schools in Eastern North Carolina. The Rosenwald schools held, hold a unique place in history and they also held a special place in the hearts and minds of African American families who fought and made sacrifices so their children could receive an education. Um, some of that was an excerpt from Brenda Hamilton, who was the granddaughter of Gary Pittman, Carrie Pittman, who gave the Rosenwald homecoming speech that was held here October 30th, 2013, in Gates County. There were six Rosenwald schools in Gates County, Buckland, Cora Peak, Hobbsville, Reeds Grove, which is the EIC building a lot of people uh, call it, Reynoldson and Roduca number two. Currently there are three standing, Roduca, which is a private residence, Cora Peak School, and Reeds Grove School, which is the EIC building. Buckland transitioned into Buckland Training School, which is now Buckland Elementary, and Sunbury transitioned to Sunbury Training School, which is now T.S. Cooper School. Reeds Grove School is owned by the county. In 2011, with the growing Gates strategic planning process that involved the residents of Gates County, the goal was to identify economic development strategies that would help bring tourism to the county. The designation of the Reeds Grove School as a historic building was one of those strategies. Funding was obtained from two grants, the Growing Gates Project, which is currently a part of the current Gates County Strategic Plan developed in 2021, and New Generation Youth Leadership Project, which involved 4-Hers. As a result, the historic application was submitted and approved August 30th, 2011. Two historic markers were placed on site. The Reeds Grove Homecoming Program was held October 30th, 2013. A booklet was compiled and a copy was given to the Historic Society along with many of the alumni of these schools. We recorded uh, interviews with them so we would have them for history's sake. Um, 
The project would not have been possible without the assistance of the Reed Grove Alumni Committee. This was a collaboration of Gates County Extension, local government, youth, and adults. Currently, the Cora Peak alumni and friends are interested in preserving their school. I will be working with them to achieve this goal. We welcome Commissioner Hoffler to assist as the, pre as the pre preservation of history is her passion. Commissioners, even though some renovations have been done on the Reeds Grove School in the past, attention was not and has not been given to ensuring renovations and maintenance of the interior was or will be completed in a fashion that would support the integrity of the historic building and bring it back to its original glory. I ask that the integrity of the building be restored with some attention and care as with the same attention and care as was done with this historic courthouse. I also ask that commissioners support Rosenwald School activities in Gates County. In addition, the Reed Grove School, Cora Peak School, and identification of locations of others with markers is an asset to the county African American tour project that Commissioner Hoffler is pursuing. We also welcome Commissioner um, Hoffler with any other suggestions and ideas. There are others in the audience that support the Rosenwald schools in Gates County and Madam Chair, if you would like for them to raise their hand or stand, please do so. They may raise their hand or stand okay. if they're in the office. Okay. Okay. In closing, um, we are who we are today due to these types of schools and the vision of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington and our forefathers who knew the importance of a quality education. This has not changed during our times. And I quote, if you want to understand today, you have to search yesterday. A PowerPoint of the Rosenwald schools has been presented to the commissioners and it is going to be loaded on the commissioner web page for those that are, that are interested. In addition, um, Fisk University has a Rosenwald School database. And so I was going to get this done before I retired, but it didn't happen. But it's happening now. Uh, we have only four pictures of the Rosenwald schools that were here in Gates County. This was the Hobbsville old school. These are going to be hung in the Reed Grove. Um, school. This one is Hobbsville. This was a, a, a second building that was done in Hobbsville. This one is the building that's in Corpy that is currently still standing. And this one is what Reed's Grove School looked like initially. Mm -hmm. I have pictures of the one in Roduca, but since it is a private residence. I did not want to put those up. And also the comments uh, that were made on the four aspects of the history of Rosenwald schools will be hung with that. Okay. Are there any questions? Are there any questions or comments from Ms. Green Hollis? Is she stuck there at the podium? Well, certainly I have. I have known about Rosenwald schools for numerous years, and I was at the 2013 program. I believe I spoke there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you, and Commissioner Freeman was there as well. Um, and it was, I can remember the Hopsal School, so it has been destroyed since, or has disappeared since in the last 20 years, I guess. Um, and it's, we need to preserve those. Um, this African American Heritage Trail, they won't. Um, 
to have places to visit, not just a sign. Um, they want something to go into and all. And I would suggest maybe that you might want to tour Jarvisburg and Currucut County. They have done an excellent job restoring that to the original kind of the layout and all. And they do have that, um, that you might want to check with them and also step with Reed Thomas. Um, we have checked with Reed Thomas when we did the initial Reed's Grove, and I have all his recommendations for how the building should look and what we should do to preserve the historical aspects of it. Just some of the repairs or replacement of lights have not been historically correct. And there is a divisional wall that pulls down that makes it into two classrooms. It was a two classroom uh, school and that wall is still in the wall, but it has been covered up with um, sheetrock etc and that really needs to be and that's uh, probably a very easy fix yeah uh, and all but you still have the platform and the larger medium room that's pretty much yeah intact. any other questions there's a wall in the reeds building that was erected a few years ago um, i don't believe it goes all the way to the right. ceiling are, are you talking about taking that wall down no um it depends on when you talk with reed thomas what they suggest but at least having the wall that divided the two restored and go back and take the fluorescent lights out and put the, they had lights similar to this one hanging there. And just, um, there are some co cosmetic things that can be done in his recommendations to keep it more on the historical uh, perspective versus um, what, some of the things that have been done. And of course, they do have recommendations of the paint colors, et cetera, because these were all built to enhance the light using the natural light, et cetera, to help with learning process. And so I have all of that. Any other questions or comments for since you've come before? Great presentation. Thank you. And the Core Peak. Uh, individuals are going to start meeting to figure out what they can do with the building. It's located beside their church. I see Mrs. Bird is here. Yes. Mrs. Bird is going to help with that. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Very enlightening to many of us. And we will, as a board, we will have some discussion about what we need to do as a board of commission. We own the building, this county building, so. So, but thank you. She did a lot of work. She called me a couple of months ago with all of this paraphernalia and things in her attic. And I didn't know what she was talking about. And she contacted Fish University and the money that was used to uh, frame those pictures, they already had those funds. No, no county funds were used to do that, uh, per se. So she already had from the leftover from the other committees, I guess, when y'all was meeting. And so she went to work and got that done, and I appreciate it. On behalf of the board, we really appreciate that work you put in. And um, um, I forgot to say there will be little plaques put on the pictures in order. Little plaques put on the pictures, so I guess description, mm -hmm. they're on order. Uh, Ms. Hoff, I, uh, I know you're the historian, and I know you have your plate full, <laughs> but uh, you're the historian <laughs> for the county and work very closely with uh, their committee when they get their committee together to ensure that. We stay informed and task it. Anybody want to help, Miss Hoff? But Commissioner Hoffman, just raise your hand. I'll accept help. <laughs> if, she, if she needs help, I'll be glad to help. Okay. Now, y'all, we're just here at it. Credit. Commissioner Credit. Let me write this down. Write that down. I'm not going to sign it, but I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Thank you for volunteering. Yeah. Madam Chair, the, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we didn't spend a lot of thank you time on the Housing Committee. We sure did. Um, but they, uh, they deserve our applause for the work that they do and the people who volunteer along with them. I know they're not all here, and I know that uh, Anthony can tell you that the numbers, the number of volunteers used to be a little bit larger. I can, I can remember that myself. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, but we need to applaud what they have all done. All right. I'd like to say I forgot to mention that I was uh, in Hereford last week with uh, Michael Irvin, who's the director of Admiral Commission. He's the one that's writing the grant, well, have written the grant for our urgent repair program. 
and we're waiting on uh, information whether we're going to get granted for that. But he did, I did mention the housing committee, and they are very interested in using the housing committee to funnel you know, applications to them because they're in the county. And so uh, I'm going to um, let him know that, that Reba Green Holly has presented. He knows who Reba is and shows us Sharon Smith. She's their uh, program developer, her, their grant writer, and they want to work with the county uh, with the housing committee when we get that grant. Not if, but when we get that grant uh, so that we can have a, a seamless from our citizens to our uh, FMO commission. Okay. Now we're going to have uh, administrative reports. Mr. Chris Hill, tax report. Good evening. How are y'all? Hey, how are you? Uh, in your packet, you should have the February 2022 tax collector's report. Uh, you'll notice that we did collect about $260,000 in February. Uh, that put our collection rate up about 1% higher than it was at this time last year. Funds from the DMV are still strong, uh, $82,000 in DMV funds. We have sent uh, any delinquent accounts to the Gates County Index, so that will be out next week. Um, we received $4,600 from Zakia's Legal Services in the month of February. Any other questions regarding the report? Any questions from the commissioners? I did want to bring up, um, it's on the agenda, the dates for the Board of Equalization and Review. Uh, in past years, we've tried to um, combine those with commissioners' meetings since we're all here at one time. Um, so if it pleases the board, I looked at the calendar and it looks like to me the next date for commissioner meeting will be the 20th of April and the one after that will be the 18th of May. If we can convene and reconvene on one of those dates if, if that pleases the board. Two Is this meetings. for equalization and review? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yep. The board Two meetings will take care of that. Yes, sir. We have to open and close it. Okay. And we had to have it 30 days apart, or I believe it. Yeah, it's close to 30 days, three to four weeks. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board? No, he no hearing, excuse me, no hearing, public hearing involved. No, sir. Mm -hmm. We'll open it, and then if anyone has any, um, <clears throat> if anyone has any appeals, they'll call my office and they'll schedule the appeal with me. If we can't work it out, then I'll bring that to the board between the opening and the closing of the um, review board dates. And, and we need a motion on that. Yes, I've asked for a motion to pledge, pledge of the board. I make the motion, Madam Chairman. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, ask the board clerk to please put those on the calendar, April the 20th and May 18th. And we just had those prior to our meeting. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, and depending on what the outcome of the meeting dates are, then we've been doing it like you know, 30 minutes before the meeting starts. So mm -hmm. I'll need to, I guess I'll find out <clears throat> later this evening or tomorrow if the dates are, if the times are going to change. So when I publish that in the newspaper, I can have the right times in there. Okay. Uh, before you take your seat, I'm going to call up uh, Mr. Uh, Your from Your precinct. I was contacted indirectly uh, by Mr. Your about a piece of property that he wants to discuss with the board as far as uh, his proposal. So that's why I'm calling him up now. He's also been in conversation with Mr. Hill. My name is Perry Ewell. Mm -hmm. I live in 230, Point of High Road, Ewell, North Carolina. I've been living there all my life. I got a few things to be all right if I pass these eight. Sure. Oh, the board clerk, could pass. she'll pass them out for you, sir. Well, I'm going to get mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, thank you. Several weeks ago, uh, they had a tax sale at the courthouse door, and uh, your, your volunteer fire department was very interested in it because the land was adjacent to their parking lot. 
And uh, the lawyer there who auctioned off the property, he didn't understand why I didn't get a bid for it. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, the reason you didn't get a bid for it is a liability rather than an asset. <laughs> and uh, that same piece of property, probably most of you don't remember, but when Renee McGinnis was the tax administrator, was advertised to be sold, but for some reason they pulled it from the document, said the paperwork going right. So what I'm trying to say is the county haven't received a cent of tax from that piece of land in over 30 years. If you look at the uh, piece of white paper on the on the left there, your packet, uh, you can see the, the highlighted piece of uh, is the land that we're talking about. It's less than two tenths of an acre. You can't put a trailer on it. Can't put a septic tank on it. It's just useless. Uh, and if you stand, if you would stand in front of, if, if you're familiar with it, in front of your fire department and face away from the building, it would be right in front of you. That's what you would see. Uh, two different individuals uh, donated these pictures just to show you what kind of conditions that we're talking about. The first picture in the in the black packet is taken from Corner High Road. You can see a little bit of the road there. The first picture there. The second picture, you see Corner High Road, and you can see a house to the left over there. I talked to this lady, she's a very elderly lady, uh, living by herself, and I went and talked to her about, we were trying to get the land, and she said, oh my God, please try to get the land. I'm scared the house is gonna catch on fire, and set mine on fire. It's, it, it, she said, it's, she sees rats, snakes, and skunks, and everything else out like there. In fact, one skunk was killed in right in front of it a while back. And then the third and fourth pictures uh, uh, just show the condition of the heights. Uh, you, you are a volunteer fire department. We would like to have the land. We would make it a uh, parking lot and also would be used for training. We would have more members from the uh, fire department tonight, but they had a call right at 5 o'clock. So we had planned to sort of pack the courthouse, but that didn't really happen, but we appreciate the one that did come. <laughs> It was a foul, hackless uh, we, What we would like, we would appreciate if you would consider donating this land to the fire department and we would make it an asset for the community, for the county, and uh, we would be able to use it for parking, for training, and a lot of the fire departments go from one place to the other for training, cross training, and we would be used for that, not only by you, but for the other fire department. Any, uh, any questions from Madam Chair? You uh, you said that uh, Mr. Ewer had been in contact with Chris. Was that yes? I talked yeah. talk to him. Check on the uh, rules or something. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Checking on the rules and the history, and I also spoke with the a county attorney mm -hmm. about. Does there have to be any transaction taking place to make it legal? What we have done, the county has already purchased the land, being that it was not bid on at the um, auction. So we're waiting for the deed to come back from Zacchaeus. Once the deed comes back from Zacchaeus, we can't re record that deed to the county until the taxes and the, you know, the back taxes and the attorney's fees are paid. Uh, that's $7,917.11. That was the opening bid. Uh, so once we receive the deed from Zacchaeus and the county pays the taxes and the, um, and the legal fees, then it's up to the county if they wanted to do a deed gift. I would be more adept in talking about that as far as transferring the property to the fire department. And that would also make the property tax exempt going forward from 2023 because the fire department would own the property. So we wouldn't have to worry about the taxes on it anymore. Okay. Well, I think the appropriate, I I think yeah. the appropriate yeah. after we discuss, I think the appropriate commissioner to make any motion or anything is sitting over here to my right. 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 Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't have any discussion. I've um, heard Mr. Ewer's presentation and everything and hear the details on it. I, I don't have anything else to say. Does the county attorney has any input? Uh, no, Chris is correct. Once the county uh, gets the deed back from Zacharias, then I could do a prepare a deed of gift if, if the commissioners uh, wish to donate it to uh, your volunteer fire department, which, which would be the right thing to do, I would think. Commissioner Freeman? I, I, would, I would certainly be in favor of that, Madam Chairman. In fact, uh, the county of Gates donate that property and, and those adjacent properties to uh, to the Ewer Fire Department for their use in training and parking. Commissioner Hoffler? 
Fine with me. All right. Well, I'd like to make a motion when the taxes and everything are paid and like it's supposed to be that we gift this land to the Yule Volunteer Fire Department, free of charge. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, have a Thank gift. you, ma'am. Thank you. It's, it's when it costs much more to clean up that land <laughs> than, than what the bid was. In fact, it, it, I think, the best I remember, we got an eyesore ordinance on the book. Uh, if somebody had turned it in, uh, yeah. you know, it, it would be right back on the county to clean it up if the code enforcement deemed that it was necessary to, to clean it. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Very Thank well. You. Yes, sir. Good to see you brought your secretary with you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, departmental reports. Um, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, finance report. It's out. One. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I don't have many updates for th for this evening for the board. In your packet, um, in the report. In the finance report, there is the sales tax revenue update that we received. Um, this would have been for December sales, and that was actually the highest that we have received this fiscal year. So we are still on track with um, receiving. The projections are showing that we will receive more than um, what we had budgeted, so that's still on track there. Um, just an update with where we currently are with the fiscal year 23 budget planning. In February, um, the county manager and I had met with the department heads to go over their budget. And currently, I'm, I'm working on compiling all those requests into, into the one report and looking at some revenue projections for next year. Um, we do hope to have the budget presentation um, <clears throat> together for the April meeting. We are still waiting on some um, information that would be pertinent to the budget, such as retirement percentages, et cetera, that um, could change the figures. So I'm hoping to have those in this month so we can include those um, in the budget and have the budget presented in April. I would recommend um, that the board be thinking about, if we are still on track, that at that April meeting to discuss and set um, or schedule the times you would like to do the work sessions in between April and the May meeting. Um, if we are on, like I said, if we, if we stay on schedule, we are going to try to have the public hearing in May. That will give the board time to then come back together after public comments and things, if there are any you know, other work sessions you would like to have before we would need to ad adopt the budget in June. So, um, but I did want you guys to be thinking how many work sessions you would, you would like to have. Um, if you want department heads to be there, how we need to schedule them, et cetera, so that we can put that on the calendar next, next month. Okay. Um, and I did, I did um, want to comment on the information that Mr. Lyons had presented um, for the for the one recommendation on the in, internal controls, I did speak with him when he first sent this information, and um, so we did discuss how important it is. It's one of those things I think probably most departments put to the side those internal processes to write down because who has time to sit down and write the internal processes? But it is hard when you have such a small staff and somebody's out sick and you're, and you're trying to, to figure out what to do. So I did, um, I have discussed, discussed that with him. So I was aware of that as well. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Alp? I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, where we stand at on prepayment? Not bank drafts, but actually being able to pay it here for the water department. I know it was brought up a couple of meetings ago. I was just wondering. Um, as as far as I know, for, from, the, from the finance side, um, I was taking care of the part of how to get it set up in um, in the accounting system. Now, are we talking about prepayments or the bank drafts? Prepayments. All, all I was working on was making sure it was set up properly in the finance system. I'm not sure if that was a discussion that was 
to be discussed again at another meeting. Yeah, I think I think that you know we currently have an ordinance, and I believe that we were going to establish that once we got the policy went from ordinance to policy, okay. Okay. and then we were going to do that because I think I remember making the motion that we uh, continue to let people make prepayments. Um, and so what what I made sure of is that. Whereas before it was posting to the revenue line, and, and that was a part of um, in his presentation earlier when he was talking about the water fund and the net position had gone down from because it, the revenue line had been overstated because of the overpayment or prepayments. Um, so now they're being posted in the correct place in the general ledger until that money is actually earned by the county. So on the finance side, it, it is cor correct, and that, that was last time I was aware of, of anything. I don't know if that was, if that answered the question. So, so you, the bottom line is we're accepting, we're we accepting, can, we're we accepting can accept prepayments. prepayments. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> don't go too far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, where's my notes? Now we're going to have um, E911 Radio, Heather Sini, and Jason Sample to present for us. Good evening. Good evening. Um, well, I'll let Heather go first. We're going to talk about the, the status of the 911 Center, and then I'll get into the radio section. Okay. Okay, um, so I have been tasked with obtaining quotes for various different equipment um, for the 911 Center, um, being which computers, um, software technology, servers, um, a recording system, and whatnot. Um, so I have the different quotes, but this evening is the Motorola radio quote um, that will tie into... Um, part of emergency management's um, stuff that's going on. Um, I have it here. So far, the quote is for three hundred and twelve thousand. This is just a portion of it. Three hundred and twelve thousand one hundred eighty-nine dollars and eighty cents. That will get our radio consoles that we use at the desks that transmit out into the public all the wiring, the cables, the radios in the back room, up to the antenna, and um, this does not include, however, our backup center that is at Perquimans. That is a whole separate, separate um, quote for that. Um, currently, after speaking to the 911 board in reference to the emergency telephone system funds, that is a group within the 911 board that will cover part of this funding. Um, out of that $312,000, they will cover $118,025.15, which is like a 38, um, it, it comes as a percentage from part of the equipment that we use and a percentage of out of the service agreements that are required in order to keep all the systems functioning. Um, so that will leave a balance of $194,164.65 that will have to come out of um, general funds from the county. With that being said, we, I'm also um, investigating grant options. I'm also signed up to take the grant um, program classes that are gonna be um, next week. Um, and you have to attend those in order to get the grant at all. Um, and it will cover portions or all. I'm going to find out exactly what all that entails so that I'll, I'll know for the future. That, however, funds will not come until after <coughs> the budget year. It'll be 2023. So I won't be able to use those funds currently. Okay. 
Is that your presentation? Yes. Because I'm going to ask for questions to come in during the segment so we don't get confused. Mm -hmm. So she's talking about, Seaman Cena is talking about the current 911 center. Yes. Okay, so are there questions about her presentation? The expenditure she's talking about is for our current PSA. Mm -hmm. okay. The $118,000 um, comes from the state. Yes, from the 911 board, yes. 911 board. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, the um, grant that you were referring to, does that have a name? Do you know what that name of that grant is? It's the PSAP manager's um, grant. Okay. Yeah. Right. And it's going to be a virtual online, um, you know, everything's held up from COVID. So right. <laughs> it'll be something that um, we do online. Okay. And you plan on attending? Yes, yeah. I've already registered. Is this 118 on top of what our regular E911 from the state, or the 118 is only the portion that the 911 board will cover? Okay. Out of that 312,000, okay. the other almost 200,000 is on us. Okay. So there, that's the purpose for attending the grants right. um, sessions. And that other was the 194. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The general fund is one ninety four. Correct. Heather, do you think is there anybody else that you think will, should attend that uh, seminar with you? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can invite anyone that I like. I have the email address. Yeah. Only one person can apply for the right. grant, yeah. though. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I didn't know if maybe a, a, a backup person or something. Just, Correct. just a thought. I don't have any. any Anybody in mind or anything? But. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. I'll take it into consideration. Okay. Second part. Um, I want to uh, propose that we move forward that y'all vote to hopefully uh, buy radios, which covers portables and mobiles for the fire departments, emergency management, EMS, and the Gates County Sheriff's Office. I do have a quote from Motorola. Uh, there is a Motorola representative here right now, but that would cover 120 fire department or fire certified radios, uh, 60 radios for emergency management, EMS, and Gates County Sheriff's Office. Uh, that's 10 port or, uh, mobile radios that go inside the, the box trucks, the medic units, uh, 20 mobile radios to go inside the sheriff's officer's cars, because the portable is not going to cover across the whole county, but with the added uh, repeater inside the, uh, the, the added mobile unit. That'll give them coverage throughout the whole county. Um, 25 of those, uh, 25 mobile units will be included for emergency management and the volunteer fire departments. Um, again, that'll go inside the vehicles. We only have, you know, two, uh, but all the fire trucks, all their frontline trucks will get equipped with all the, the newer equipment. Um, and all this uh, quote also includes extra batteries, charging stations, uh, microphones, the programming, the encryption, the warranties. Um, right now we're looking at $1.1 million just shy of that. Um, the price goes up come March 28th because it's the end of the quarter. Um, and Kim has some finance options, so that when I get done, you know, I'm pretty sure you'll have some questions about those. Um, Motorola is willing to give us a couple of more discounts if Y'all didn't move forward with it, and we can include that $200,000 from the 911 center can be included in this loan or grant also. Mm. So that goes up a little bit to roughly 1.4, um, but that would cover everything. And that's, like I said, all the first responders for the county. And when I say emergency management, that also covers a couple of radios for me and for essential personnel that are going to come back in the case of a natural disaster. Right now I have two radios, and this is the newer one that was 2013. So um, the sheriff, he has, I believe, six radios for emergency management right now, and uh, EMS has given them some of his radios, too. So I know the sheriff's farm is in dire need of them. But, um, again, the Motorola rep is here. Um, price goes up, you know, come March 28th, it's the end of the quarter, and um, that's what we're looking at is to cover all the radios for all first responders for the county, sheriff's office, EM, volunteer fire departments, portables and mobiles. Um, and I'm also applying for a grant also. It's for emergency management through the state. It's up to $400,000. It's a competitive grant. There's only about eight counties in the state that can't apply for it just for population. Um, just about everybody's putting in for, for radios from my understanding, um, other than a couple of vehicles. So I will be 
applying for that. I have until April 15th to get that paperwork together, and then that'll be approved you know, coming in this new fiscal year. So my, my object and goal is if we get whatever money we do get approved, if for any, we'll go straight towards this loan or the, the, for the radios. Okay. So any questions? If, like, if, yeah, and this might be for, is this like a state contract pricing? Yes. Or it is state contract pricing. Um, let me, let me, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep, okay. keep everybody, no, 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 that's okay. I, we need to do two things, one thing at a time. One thing, we need to vote, if it so pleases the, the, the Board of Commissioners, to buy the radios. The second, once we get that motion, then we're going to start talking about the options. I, I handed out a handout to you uh, that I received when I uh, arrived at the courthouse today. So the first motion I think we need is to purchase the radios. So move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A motion, it, we need a motion. You, he, he, he just okay. motioned. You want second? I'll second that motion. Okay, the motion is second that we purchase the radios. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank Board you. clerk, make sure that's in the minutes. Now we're going to talk about Ms. Kim and the representative, if they want to come up. We have a handout at your desk where Kim has provided uh, radio purchasing options. Okay? So now we're going to purchase the radio. <laughs> so now y'all get to hear all this minutia <laughs> of what. Well, I've got, I've got a question before she ever says anything. Okay. <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay. okay. J just so we are, we're on the same page, the information that you have in front of you right now is only for the radios, mm -hmm. not for the radios well, plus what um, Heather was Heather. speaking about. It's separate. It's separate. Um, because when I was pulling together this information today, I wasn't aware that she would gotten her quote back with what was eligible or not. So we pu I pulled that out. So. Okay, so hers is so tomorrow. just what uh, Jason was talking about. Okay. She won't. That's the Just the, just the, just the, just the radios. This is just for the radios. Just for the radio. We're going okay. to make it clear, we'll, we just voted to purchase the radios for the first responders. Yes. Okay. Okay. So on um, the purchase, the radio purchasing option, um, sheet that Dr. Riddick was referring to. Um, as Jason has stated, the purchase price is one million nine hundred and sorry, one million ninety six thousand three hundred and twenty dollars. That does not include sales tax. Sales tax is an additional seventy four thousand. So just so you know what numbers we're talking about. Option one would be that the county would decide to purchase um, hundred percent using ARP funds. The county is out Gates County is allocated to receive in total two million two hundred forty five thousand seven hundred and eighty three dollars. So if you purchase hundred percent of the radios, your remaining balance for your grant funds is the one million one hundred forty nine thousand four hundred and sixty three dollars. This, this is an eligible purchase using ARP, ARP money. It falls under the revenue um, loss category that they had um, mm -hmm. lifted those restrictions on. Mm -hmm. So you can purchase the radios through there. I did want you to, mm -hmm. to realize, too, how much of that grant money you would have left. But you would not be paying interest. So that's option one. Option two um, would be to finance the purchase. Um, I have two different quotes on interest rates. I did not break that down in, in this, but I was just giving you a range depending on if you selected one year, three years, or 59 months. So your range of interest you could potentially pay is anywhere between 29000 to $87,000. Um, and I had, I had also reached out to Southern Bank because that is the bank that the county county uses and they were very gracious in trying to get me to a very in a very quick turnaround time some of these these interest rates as well to finance um, in both options we could pay we could pay early um, but there's some there's some restrictions or there's certain restrictions to that um, so before I go any any further are we we okay with just the financing what the different your interest in your different terms was the was the early pay um, was it critical? Did, did it move the meter any? 
the penalty well, you're talking about? Well, there's no penalty to no pay penalty. early. Okay. Um, if we finance through Motorola, we would have to pay on your annual, whatever your annual, and you correct me if I say this, this incorrectly, um, you would have to pay on your annual payment date, but you couldn't just put a portion to it. You'd have to pay the whole thing off. Whereas um, with going through the bank, you, it's kind of like with your mortgage, you could put more money towards it, but you wouldn't have to pay the whole thing off. So um, I, have some, I have some potential revenue sources if we decided to finance. Um, Medicaid hold harmless estimates have come out this month. Gates County is estimated to receive, and it's over the 596,000. Um, as, as you guys recall, we received 90% in March, 10% in August of next year, only if the actual numbers come back and the county doesn't have to pay that money back. So you really don't know until August of the following year if you're gonna get to keep your estimate if you get more or if you have to pay it back. But that's what we're, we're um, estimating at for this year. Since I've been with the county, we have never had to pay back our Medicaid hold harmless money. I say that now and that this would be the year that something would change. Um, and then as Jason spoke about, he's also applying for that grant money. So in a, if, you're, if you're thinking very optimistically, if he received the full 400,000, plus what we're looking at for the Medicaid hold harmless, you do have the potential of being able to pay this off early if that, if, if that worked out that way. So any questions about that before I go into what, what I recommend that the board do with this, this information? And any question before she gives a recommendation? Well, that would be my first comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what would you recommend? Okay. Well, first I was going to say I would recommend that the, that the board go ahead and purchase the radio before the quote expires um, March 28th because the prices will go up and we are in desperate need of these radios. And we have to. Right. Um, my second recommendation would be that the board would have a work session to discuss our various grants and how the county would like, where we would like to go, how we would like to use those funds before we just right now say, yeah, let's just go with option one, because we don't know which projects we would like to use those ARC funds for. And depending on what the project is, you could potentially leverage other grants with the state. I don't know that you can leverage any other grants with the radios, but at least to have a work session to, to discuss that. In the meantime, um, we go ahead and, and finance the purchase while we determine, based on a couple of these revenue streams that I feel like we could we could get some money. We we may not get the full four hundred thousand on the grant, but the the county could potentially get that money, and hopefully we get to keep our Medicaid hold harmless money. And that if we finance, that we we do have the goal of trying to pay this off early, so that the county does not have to pay a lot in interest. Um, I did not include sales tax in our financing because the. The county would have the money in the checking account to go ahead and pay it. We are not like the state, we are not tax exempt. So we have to, anytime we make a purchase, we have to pay the sales tax. But what I do at the end of the year is I can file with the North Carolina Department of Revenue for a refund back on those sales tax. So essentially, we're paying it right now, but we're gonna get that 74 back. So I didn't think we should pay interest on something that you know we can zero out that way. <laughs> uh, quick question. How much money, and this might be a question, how much money would it save us if we grouped them, the E911 radios and the rest of the radios together? My manager uh, with Motorola has given me approval that if you do group them together right now, we'll provide Heather with two backup radios from 911, they'll be portable radios, and the equipment that is on the Paquimans County 911 tower that needs to go up on the tower. That cost, which is in the 30-ish range, 30,000 range, they will absorb that within this. So that would be your discount if you merge the two together. So if we go ahead and merge them together, we'll get our backup for Paquimans. We'll go ahead and get that antenna system squared away under this project. It mm -hmm. will merge it together in that bundle if you can do both of them before March 28th. 
And the two radios that you're talking about will be the same quality as what we're going to be purchasing? They will. They'll be the high quality APX 8000. Mm -hmm. They'll actually be a dual band radio. They'll do VHF or 7800. They'll sit in chargers up on Heather's console, and that'll satisfy your uh, backup certification that she was worried about. So we'll, we'll make that happen. Now, the, so the two things that you just talked about, if we can, if we combine those and uh, you're about third, roughly thirty thousand dollars expense for the tower absorbing that, the two radios, is that contingent upon whether we use our bank or Motorola for financing? No. Okay. Is there a particular contract associated with that? There is. Um, Heather, and, Heather's got everything. Uh, and and has, okay. there, there's two separate quotes that we had, and we would just merge those together into one. And uh, I think one was for roughly $312,000, and the other one, $1,094,000. So those two together yeah. would be about a million four from the I remember. And uh, anything that you've got to take off of that, any not only one funding that you could buy it. We would finance the rest of it as Motorola. Mm -hmm. um, no penalties for early payoff on the thing. Could you, you could you speak in the mic? So the oh, mic. Sorry. <laughs> it would just stretch it out over time for you. I'll give you an option for that. And the March 28th deadline is the deadline, and I can keep all the promo pricing mm -hmm. and everything and kind of bundle it together and help you out price wise. But I can't extend it after that. What kind of service contract? I mean. Um, the service contract as far as maintenance. The radios carry a, I believe there's a five-year warranty that we've got on the radios for factory warranty. The uh, 911 center, I believe, has a one-year warranty on all that equipment. At that time, you would merge it into like a maintenance contract deal. And, and um, Heather, you've got the figures on Our maintenance contract is not dependent on the county to pay, though. The 911 board pays for that. Okay. They also pay for um, the upgrades to the radios every three years, which is, a, that's $31,368. And then through the course of five years of maintenance is another $60,700. Okay. That they pay also? They pay that also. Okay. Okay. So with the one year that's offered through Motorola, plus with the 911 board will cover, we won't need anything for a while as far as that goes. And if, so you feel like the contract obligation has been met by us, by, by Gates County, to you? That's right. That, that's all into this proposal here. And I want to highlight one other thing, too. The, the radios and all are under a state contract. We priced it under the North Carolina state contract. But in addition to that contract, for you, we added an additional $165,000 discount off a state contract in with the figure that you've got. So... I don't want you to think that we just went state contract. We really went low um, because of the quantity of the radius. And then we're going to add the extra little sweeteners for you if you can get it all bundled before the 28th. Good salesmanship. <laughs> Any other questions or clarification? Well, I guess one last comment that if we, cho if we choose tonight just to go with the financing option, the board has a work session to discuss our grants. You can always come back and say, no, we, we want to to use the grant money for the radios and, and we can go ahead and pay it off. That's always an option, but I did want the board to at least have, you know, a work session to discuss the various grant funds that we have and is this what you want to use them for before we just decided that tonight. So. So we check our calendars and put a date for work session. Yep, yep. Right now she needs a, a motion to finance through, which one was it? Which one did y'all choose? Uh, well, I think, uh, I th well, yeah, I'm in favor. Option one. Well, I don't think we've decided on the financing. The financing. Um, so the 28th is coming. So what do we want to? We got a bunch. Was was there any save, significant savings between going Motorola or Southern Bank? Southern Bank did give us a lower interest rate, and we if we pay early. We don't have to pay the full amount off at one time. So if we come into 500000 then we can pay put towards the principal, whereas if we try to pay off early um, through Motorola um, financing, we would have to pay the whatever the remaining balance was. Unless, unless we were putting money down 
net 30 days of the contract, that would be considered a down payment with Motorola. So. And it's not going to affect our pricing if we go with something. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to yes, purchase the radios for... For the rescue squad, I would like the to bundle first responders. First responders, e nine one one. I would like to group them all together. Go ahead and get that savings, and uh, and finance through Southern Bank. That's my motion. Okay, I'll second that motion. We have a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Need anything else? Thank you. We, Thank you. We, we need to. We got to set aside for our workshop. workshop. I got the workshop down. Y'all can go. <laughs> one, one, one more addition to that. <clears throat> How quick can we get some of those radios? I'm sorry. Yeah, excuse me. You, you, you need to speak in the mic. <laughs> we actually. Um, Got two demo radios for the sheriff to use, two portables like this with Mike's, okay. uh, to help him out because he was in a jam with a couple of deputies he had just hired. Down uh, that was for 90 days. We have commitment from Motorola that we will work on getting the sheriff his radios first out of the batch, so we'll put priority on that. Yep. Uh, the rest of it, due to the shipping delays and everything that everybody's going through, I just can't guarantee the rest of them, but we will prioritize his. So ship, uh, sheriff's Department and E911. Yes, and the E911 uh, consoles will definitely. The, in fact, E911, they have already went ahead and pre built, put that in a pre build phase just to jump the gun, hoping that you would go ahead and move forward with this. So they'll be thankful for that. Uh, thank you. Thank Let's you for all your work. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Any other questions before they leave? Okay, be fine. Okay. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we need to look at a um, work session date. If if you don't have your calendars, can't figure it out, I'll send an email first thing in the morning. Just let me know. I'll send an email first thing in the morning with some dates for us to consider. Oh, yeah. Commissioner Craddock? I'll, I'll talk to you. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Where am I now? Um, public hearing. Um, Ms. Cherry. I need a motion to go into to. Mm. I make a motion we go into public hearing. Second that. For the, do I need to say title, fifteen land use ordinance? Is there a motion on the floor to open the public hearing? Lisa Cherry, Planning Administrator. Okay, she's at the podium, and it's a uh, concern in Gates County, twenty twenty one title fifteen land use ordinance. So we need a motion to open. The public hearing. So, so I make a motion that we open for public hearing for the Gates County 2021 Title 15 Land Use Ordinance. Second. Jonathan. Second. Which one? I'll second. Jonathan. Commissioner Freeman seconded. We are now in public hearing. Yes, we're here for a public hearing for the text amendment 02. 201-TA-01, this proposed text amendments to the Gates County 2021 Title 15 Land Use Ordinance. This, this text amendment is to amend the Land Use Ordinance Sections 152-508-E-2 and 155-608-F, where misdemeanor penalties were included in the enforcement procedures. These were reviewed by the planning board and it was heard in the January 2022 meeting and was recommended approved by and approved by unanimous vote and forwarded to you now. And this was due to the state legislature recently adopting in their session law that we have to rescind these misdemeanor penalties. So that's what we're here for tonight. Okay. Madam Chair, in reviewing the document, mm -hmm. um, there were a whole lot fewer mm -hmm. Strike uh, strikes and changes. I mean, normally we see a whole bunch of changes. We only see um, two, I believe, here that are struck, three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but anyway, 
Um, two. You're right. Two. I'm sorry. Two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wait, we, we're we're obligated and, and basically forced. This is <laughs> this is the state. This is the state saying just check the block. Uh, so I make a motion that. Uh, uh, well, actually, can I make this motion in public here? No. Not right. yet. Mm -hmm. Do we have any? Exactly. Okay. Do we have anyone to speak? Did anyone? I saw a sign-up sheet. No one. No one. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Then I need a motion to close the public hearing. So I'll make that motion. Mm -hmm. okay. Second. 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 We have a motion to close the second. Uh, close the um, public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. Now um, we need a motion and a second <clears throat> is to request it to adopt ordinance amendment 202201-TA-01, amending the Gates County 2021 Title 15 land use ordinance for compliance with recent legislation that requires decriminalizing of some local ordinances as the amendments are both reasonable and in the public interest for the following reason. One, are necessary to comply with the standards set forth in the North Carolina General Statute for Development and two, consistency statement and remains consistent with the adopted 2017 Gates County land use plan. So I just, I just read what we are, we are adopting, and the board clerk has that uh, language, so do I have a motion? I move that we make that adoption. Second. You have a motion and a second to make that adoption. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank, Thank you, you Jolita. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We don't have any old business. We're just about to the end. Let me get to new business. We have we've taken care of the proposal for audit contract when uh, Mr. Lyons was here. We have a Roanoke Connect Holdings LLC request to partner for a grant. Uh, I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. This in your packet. Dear Chair, Dr. Reddit, please accept this letter as Roanoke Connect Holdings LLC's formal request to partner with Gates County to submit grant application for the North Carolina Great Grant, as well as federal grant opportunities that are currently and in future available to your county as it relates to deployment of broadband services. Your continued support and partnership is so important to us as we are your local broadband provider focused on providing the most innovative services to your essential first responders, education, health care, courts, and administrative facilities, as well as to the residents, businesses, and visitors that are an integral part of your county. I ask that the County Board of Commissioners accept this letter in open session and affirm our request to enter into a partnership in pursuing funding opportunities from the state and federal government uh, by March 31st, 2022. As always, thank you for your continued support partnership with Bruno Connect. So they're asking for uh, uh, an affirmation that we will partner with them or give them permission to uh, apply for more funding from the state and federal governments for broadband. Sounds like it's just a formality. It's just a formality. We're doing it in an open session. Mm -hmm. It's not costing us anything. No, it's sir. Just... Do I have a motion? Just so move that we approve our continual support of the Roanoke Connect Holdings. And you second? second that motion. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Donation of property. This is a small piece of property that we received from a former citizen, I, I think, uh, um, Mr. Godwin, that wants to donate a piece of property. is 0.75 acres located at the intersection of Highway 158 and Hackley Road in the White Oak vicinity, triangular in shape. This piece of land is vacant and uncultivated with a single electricity pole erected on the lot. She stated that she inherited this land from her parents. Um, my reason for wanting to donate this parcel is that I am now elderly myself and wish to ensure that this land will benefit the county in the most optimal way. Uh, having grown up in Gates County, I maintain a strong sense of loyalty to the place I still think of as home. What's your pleasure? I make a motion we accept that as uh, presented. Uh, any discussion from our attorney? Uh, I'll second the motion. Well, before you go that far, <laughs> look, I've looked into this piece of property, and I think it would be more of a liability to the county than it would be uh, an asset. Uh, it is a triangular piece of land uh, right on 158 near White Oak as you turn on Hackley Road. 
to the right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's got a light pole on it. And I don't see that it would have any value whatsoever to the county uh, mm -hmm. for use uh, of any sort. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really, and I've, I've looked at it. I know, I know the individual. Mm -hmm. She contacted me first and then wrote a letter. I told her to write a letter to uh, Chairman Riddick and to the board. But uh, this is a situation I think we should stay away from. After after hearing that discussion, Madam Chairman. <laughs> and, Sometimes you're too fast, that's right? <laughs> and also uh, knowing the the Esquire, Mr. Godwin, as being mm -hmm. the most uh, mm -hmm. efficient attorney, uh, I will rescind my motion. And Madam Chair, I can't believe I, I seconded that motion he made over there. <laughs> and thank you for your comments. Okay, I heard a motion Godwin. on the floor not to accept the property as read into the minutes. But thank you for the generosity, however. I'm looking at my board clerk. I'd be meaning a motion to deny accepting. Yeah, I'll make a motion to deny and uh, and certainly uh, thank him for the generosity, however. Okay. Go for the fault. Need a second? I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> so move. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Where's oh, my we got to vote on it. That vote. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get these men out of here before you get talking about this March Madness, but go ahead. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Okay. Um, next on it be two more items. One is a board discussion of new position human resource director. I spoke with um, Mr. Wilson before he left, and he said that he, what he's asking is for us to consider a human resource position for the county and that tonight just ask the staff to uh, create the job description all of that and bring it back at our April meeting for discussion that's all he's asking so let's hear it do you want to move forward and have the staff charged to just get the uh, job description and all the other um, documentation we need to make a make a informed decision before we go forward I, I, I would like to make a motion to look into the human resource director and also <coughs> reach out to other counties and see their qualifications mm -hmm. and everything. Okay. Have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, board clerk, um, since Mr. Wilson is absent, please um, relay him to and his staff of preparing all that documentation um, to bring back to our April meeting. Okay. Um, the last thing uh, on the agenda is discussion of meeting times. Mr. Williams, Tim Williams, made a um, comment about uh, the meeting time for the planning board and the board of adjustments about changing um, those planning times. What did I do with it? Uh, here we are. And I'm going to read this from the county manager. What we did, uh, we was talking about it, and he did some research, and it's not as simple as we thought. We, we're in favor of it, just got to do it a different way. It states, at the request of Commissioner Freeman, the topic of meeting times of the County Board of Adjustments and the County Planning Board have been placed on this month's meeting agenda for discussion by the board. Presently, the regular meeting date of the Board of Adjustments and Planning Board are both on the third Tuesday of the month, with the, book, the Board of Adjustments meeting time being 1 o'clock and the Planning Board meeting time being 3 o'clock, as established by the Board of Commissioners in Title 15, Land Uses of the Gates County, County Code of Ordinances. The provisions of North Carolina General Statute 160D-308, Rules of Procedure, allows for either the governing board to establish meeting dates and times for appointed boards or to allow such boards to establish their own meeting dates and times. I have found it more commonplace that appointed public boards such as the Board of Adjustment and Planning Board to be afforded the opportunity to decide their own regular meeting date and time rather than having it assigned to them. In contrast, under the same Title 15 of the County Code, the County Agricultural Advisory Board has been given the opportunity to set its own regular meeting dates and time as opposed to it being assigned by the board. In Gates County, the meeting date and time has been assigned by means of the county code. As such, any change in the meeting date or time of one or both public boards would require the initiation of a, pro a proposed code amendment and the conduct of a duly advertised public hearing for any proposed change to be voted upon by the board. 
I recommend for the board's consideration the amending of the county code to allow the Board of Adjustments and Planning Board to establish their own meeting date and time, as is the case with the Agricultural Advisory Board, thereby providing consistency throughout County Code Title 15 and how appointed boards are allowed to conduct their business and organization. Should the board desire to continue to assign meeting dates and times to the Board of Adjustments and Planning Board, I would recommend confirm with the chairman of each such board prior to initiating any proposed code changes for their input on behalf of their respective boards. So it's not that simple because it's in the county code and we're going to change their, uh, allow them to change their times. We're going to have to have a public hearing and all of that resolution and things because it's in the county code. This is a, a structured board. I asked Ms. Uh, Cherry to stay. Is she still here? Did she leave? Come on. I asked her to stay because she also looked at this code um, at the time, we did not realize it was in the county's code. So it's not like a, you know, a committed policy or things like that. That's exactly right. Oh, thank yes. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is exactly right. It is set in our ordinance, and the governing board has decided to um, have it in our ordinance and made that decision. Uh, and you have a choice. It's a May, and we did do that. And the times are set in our ordinance as well as the meeting day. So it's exactly as you stated. That is fact. So, would you like to the board discussion? Would you like to to give them the opportunity to, to set their own meeting time to do that? We have to rescind. Uh, yeah, I think that, that was grand that uh, we uh, we <clears throat> hear from the chairman of those boards. But I, at the same time, after hearing two from so many citizens, quite a few that have voiced, and I think Ms. Howell and trying to think of others that would have brought up the fact that. Uh, uh, they were not able to go to certain events because of the time mm -hmm. and to bring issues and, and meet with those boards. Uh, after speaking with a couple of board members, uh, I heard that those board members are, are aged and that they like the time of day that the officers don't have to drive at night. And with that, certainly I listened to them, but also reminded them it's for the citizens, not for the board, the time of the meeting primarily for the citizens. So uh, I, th I think uh, having the chairman of those and maybe discuss that part, that is it for them or is it for the citizens? Also, you have to think about the people who have to be there. This is not just the citizens and the board members, but people who come in with um, applications applications, and, all, and some of those uh, all. But I think we just need to um, let um, each uh, that have a public hearing, I guess, is what we would need to have. But we need to have some ideas what the boards are thinking, because we might not need a yes. public hearing. Yes, yes, I uh, agree. And exactly as you stated, that would, that would be a fair thing, most certainly, to do, um, being that we have set that in our code of ordinances um, at this point. Uh, that we could do that and let the chair and let the boards have that. You know, we do our, our regular chair and vice chair elections in June. You know, that is something that we could definitely look at. Um, but it will take time to go through that process, so please realize that too. And then we have to think about locations. If it is chosen at night, you know, we have to think about those things. Um, so, and yes, it's going to be a mix. And we are here for the citizens, we're here for the public. But we also have a board uh, that people applied knowing those times, so we need to realize that as well. Th those times have been the same, I know, since I've been here. So, and it has been in our code of ordinances. So we've had people apply at these times and, and knew that. So we, we have to realize everything. Are, are we going to please everyone all the time? We know that answer. Um, but I do want to be fair. I, I feel, you know, and being involved with them and having a, hopefully a good rapport. Um, so that's just some things to consider and let them have that, that, uh, Input. that engagement, I think would be very, very uh, necessary. Um, you have had people make application and come to a meeting with representation. Yes. Uh, like an attorney or... Yes. Um, um, we have had that. Yeah, so, you know, there's that going That's on what too. I was thinking about. Yeah. I was on the plan board. Or somebody coming there, a surveyor or something like that, and they would have to come, you know, so and also, that, that's to take consideration. Also, too, 
If it's something that we know is going to be, everything's important. So please do not think that we do not think anything and not, that all is important. But if it's something that we see that the citizens want engagement and want to have representation or anything, we always have considered special meetings, special meeting times, and to have that citizen engagement. So that is something the board has always, I've never had a problem with anyone wanting to schedule a special meeting. Um, or a different meeting day, and we advertise that according to the North Carolina meeting laws, you know, set by statute. We, we do um, do that as well, so know that we consider that. So that helps, hopefully. Commissioner Crowder? So it would have to be a public hearing. To rescind it, yes, sir. To rescind it, and so it sounds like <clears throat> a little homework needs to be done. I think that each board, you need to talk to each of your boards and get some ideas about what they are interested in. And also in doing take that. A interest in what the public says too. Yeah. But we need to get theirs, you know, some yeah. feedback. Yeah, and it's important too, and, and it's just not for this board, but for other boards that if a representative, whether it be the chair person or, or somebody representing the board that when they come, and this is for all things, but I'm thinking about it for this group right now. When they come and make a um, a proposal or recommendation, whatever, they, we need to make sure that the board has voted on the recommendation that we're hearing. It's not just the chair or the representative come and say, and I think that's what we're, you know, what we're hearing. That I mean, for your group, that would be important that they took a vote, yeah. and then the vote's being represented here. When they come. And that's one of the reasons I asked Ms. Chair to stay, because I want her to take it back to each one of those boards and get their mm -hmm. input before we decide what, you know, what we need to do. We still have time, you know, if, if they come back and another conversation was had or whatever. Um, but I suggest that April, they could bring something back to the board, or yeah, cause it's the next meeting. Um, we're going to have, why are you smiling? <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here thinking um, um, we're going to have to run an ad on the public hearing. <laughs> I know we're not going to do that. It right would be, now. you know, I'm not trying to persuade the board, or whatever. But it would be <laughs> very nice if they, if they were sure this is what they, yes, what they wanted to this do. Is what, this is what that what they want? Right, right. Also, um, I'm just thinking. You know, this is getting into budget time and everything, and we keep putting all um, things to April. I mean, we have put a couple things in April already. It seems like to me tonight, uh, it gets in the getting crowded. Yeah. Well, this would have to go to the planning board definitely. So you, you would be, have an April meeting for them just to hear this, and then board of adjustment meets as necessary. So we would just, if we didn't have any applications, uh, and just to realize the process, um, if we had no applications for them to meet, we would just be meeting to ask them this question. So we could, you know, possibly, you know, poll everyone and get some feedback possibly um, so just being a good steward of you know our tax dollars um, that's something to think about because and y'all have already too. met this month correct yeah we had we did not have any business this month so, so um, but I say we let's definitely have a report back by May and okay, because they don't know if they're going to have to meet and that way, and they're going to have your elections in June anyway. Yes, we do those in June. Uh, so, you know, if we started now, that's something, and, and then bringing it back to you, the board, to vote on, you know, and you're, you get the recommendation, and then you would make your decision. It wouldn't be probably until May and June to amend that. So it, it, the process takes a little while. It does. So at least then. I like to make a motion that we ask that the planner meet with, the, I mean, that the board will come back to us by, do we say May, with their recommendation? May would be, I think, would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second. I have a motion in the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Where am I? All right, the commissioners and county, with the county, commissioner comments before the chair update. Then we have adjournment, so we're just about there. Commissioner Freeman.
Any comments to, to today? Uh, thank you. I, <coughs> I uh, appreciate what uh, what the board has discussed tonight. Certainly, what was brought forth about uh, the housing uh, and the folks that uh, were in attendance, but also the work they've done throughout the years. And we uh, we have heard from that, and we've seen uh, progress through that and through those committees and through the SS. So appreciate that. Uh, do want to bring to the attention of everyone as far as the COVID thing. I know that the uh, chair had asked me to kind of keep mm -hmm. an eye on that. And that is that certainly we, we're, the numbers are changing, changing for the good of our communities as far as infections. However, they still exist. So uh, if you've not been vaccinated, certainly uh, take advantage of that. And if you've not had your booster, take advantage of that. Uh, the highest rate that I have gotten through uh, through our Elmar Regional Health is Bertie County, and and uh, that is with the Department of Correction. I think they had 77 new infections, but uh, as of our Gates House and Cordius, we uh, we did not rise above anything that had been there before. So that's a good good sign for us. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hoffman. Oh, don't you want to talk about the mental health? Well, no. I, I brought that in to, to say a little something about it, but I had brought that up in the commissioner's meeting that they were going to be here on March the 10th. Thank you, Commissioner Hoffler. Uh, they did. Uh, Monarch uh, certainly brought their, uh, their new van, if you will, that so psychiatric patients can be uh, examined and evaluated on board. Uh, it operates between Halifax County and Gates. Uh, we... Uh, I have a photograph of it. If, you, if your eyes are better than mine, you might be able to see it. But it, it is like a motor home to a degree. It has uh, has uh, a board, three folks that will be looking after that and making those evaluations. That will save some trips. And uh, also, as far as monetary savings, it, uh, and we know from, from both our magistrates and from the law enforcement side, IVCs and voluntary commitments versus having mobile crisis and having someone to evaluate a mental situation and not uh, not having the transport and maybe having them uh, evaluated at home and kept at home. So anyway, so thank you. Bro. Yeah, it's certainly a, a, an asset that we did not have before, that we could have people here providing services. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, but certainly a lot of things going on in our community, a lot of positive things. Um, I hope that that positivity uh, continues. We have a vision uh, and we need to work toward our goals. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm a history person. And I do think that we do need to maintain the integrity of our two Rosenwald schools that exist. Um, they are few and far between at this time. Uh, and I'll do whatever I can to help that cause. Okay. Commissioner Craddock? Uh, I've got a few things to <clears throat> today. Uh, I want to thank all the citizens for coming out tonight. It's uh, good to see everybody's faces. Uh, I would like to see the whole place full every time. Uh, the Housing Committee, thank you all for what you all are doing. You're changing people's lives. It, it makes a big, that's something, yeah, something to be proud of. Uh, Ms. Reba, thank you for all the work you do throughout the county. Um, a lot of it goes unheard, but we do appreciate everything you do. Uh, e911 and emergency management, thank you for all the time. And the sheriff's department, I know they've worked on it too. Uh, putting the time in, looking at these radios. Um, I consider radios infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's a big, vital part of our our community. So uh, we're working on infrastructure. So, uh, but once again, thank you all for coming, and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Commissioner Owens. Okay. Um, again, Housing Committee, thank you for all that you do. Um, I remember um, the first time I met Henry Jordan, didn't know who he was. I went to Core Peak, took my two young sons with me, and we went out there and volunteered. And, and I saw this huge, tall guy. <laughs> And uh, so that was my first meeting with Henry Jordan. I forget how many years ago that's been, but that was a long time ago. And, uh, and Henry was, he was 
committed and dedicated uh, to that committee and, and what they did. And he was a, he was a champion for it. So um, just want to give him that that shout out. Uh, I received this in the mail from Nash County, and it's something that uh, I've shown to the commissioners. It's a solid waste ticket that you hang on your your mirror, and it, when you get to the gate, if you get in, you don't have one of those. They just motion for you to drive drive out of the facility. You know, we've had a, a conversation about this kind of thing. We talked about decals and things like that. Um, but this is something that you can put in your vehicle, you know, and if you have more than one vehicle, uh, it makes a little more sense. Uh, and they, they sent me a letter with it, uh, how they're proposing it. It's new for Nash County as well. And they sent a letter saying, why am I receiving this permit? Uh, uh, why is the county doing this? And it's real interesting. They say in there that People who are not paying their fair share <laughs> are abusing the system. So we're going to be looking at this. I've, like, again, I've shared it with the, with the commissioners here uh, just real briefly um, when we got here to the meeting. Uh, so uh, you'll be hearing about that. It, it, uh, hopefully it'll be something that'll help us. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay, for chair update, I have four items very briefly. The Unitin Monument, that's the monument that um, the Monument Committee um, brought to the commissioners last year uh, in lieu of addressing the Confederate Monument across the street. Okay. Across the street, took my focus away. Um, anyway, I talked with uh, the committee chair, most of Lee Brooks, we call him Mo. I spoke to him twice, the last time was Monday. and. Uh, I asked him to get his, to reconvene that committee, the same committee, and start planning on the program and the unveiling of the monument. It's just about ready. It's been slowed down by COVID and supply chain and all that. But they have reached out to us. I've talked to the county manager. He's chosen the, the, the space, which is right across um, the, the street here in the vicinity of the, of the Confederate monument. And he's going to prepare that so that they can come and pull the slab set the monument, and then we're going to wrap it up until the unveiling. We have to choose a date and a rain date, and I've asked his committee to, to make some suggestions. I also uh, shared with him, and I shared with uh, Commissioner Hoffler, who's my co-chair when we um, were working with the committee, that during that ceremony, that program, we're going to have a, a short program here in the courthouse, and then move across the, the way to unveil and have a little ribbon cutting and everything. But we want to recognize those staff persons at the high school that helped uh, with Mr. Uh, Beamons when he was you know, in distress. So we're going to recognize them individually as, and, and as a group and have him here as well for that program. That shows unity. On that monument, they wanted to call it the, U the U United We Stand or the Unity Monument. What better way to show the unity in Gates County for this most recent uh, efforts that they had at that high school. So they're going to be working on that. Uh, the commissioners, I asked you to be working on logistics. You know, the county manager already knows what he has to do as far as um, choose the location, get it graded so the water doesn't pull. He tell me all this stuff. I don't know what he's talking about. But anyway, we got to get a program together. We got to get an announcement out, invitations out. Think about who you would like to invite. But it's open to the public. But we want to make sure some people get you know invitations from the from the board and from the committee. We want the committee to drive this. So. We are going to keep you informed of that, but that's finally coming to fruition after almost a year. You heard about the Urgent Repair Program grant application. I did talk with Michael Irvin last week about that, and he wants to collaborate, as I said, with the Housing Committee uh, so that we can get that moving swiftly. The third thing, and almost the last, um, the North Carolina Rural Summit will be held Monday and Tuesday, 21st and 22nd, in Raleigh Hilton. I was invited to participate on a, broke, a breakout session a three-person panel is discussing building better broadband, what's next for infrastructure and digital equity. I will be on a panel with Assistant Secretary Nate Denny and Director Angela Bailey. And my role is to speak about the criticality of broadband service and digital equity from the role of an educator and elected official from a rural county. So I'm not just representing Gates County, I'm representing the rural counties. And I've been working on that presentation, short presentation, and I, I met with the panel by Zoom last, last Friday for about an hour, trying to get ready for next week. So I'll be traveling on your behalf. And they're paying all the expenses. No, we're not spending any of the county's money for me to sell the Hilton. Uh, they're, pay, they're paying all my, my expenses, and, cure, and especially gas. So I'm, that would have that sealed or any paid that. 
Now, another announcement I just got on an email this week. I serve on the Gates Partnership for Help Committee as a liaison with the commission, before the commissioners. They asked me uh, about a couple of months ago about um, purchasing some a, uh, what automated external defibrillators, AEDs, with some of the grant money that we have in the county. So I said, put a proposal together and see what you're talking about. So I, I got in touch with the um, Superintendent Barry. He sent it to me, I don't know, Yesterday, I don't know. Yesterday, I'm going to send it sometime this week. But anyway, I have it, um, and I'm going to. I, did I forward it to the commissioners? I've, I've been having email trouble. But anyway, you got it. Okay. Well, anyway, we're going to try to partner with them and purchase AEDs for all the facilities, all the schools in the school system. And when I talked to the county manager, he said that's a good idea. Why don't we make sure we have them for our facilities, our county buildings as well? So we're going to try to get not try. We're going to try to use some of the funding. It's minimal to get the AEDs for the school system, the community center, all of their property, and for the county building that we have, so that we can also, and with the latest um, incident with Mr. Beeman, is, is, this is right on time, as far as, and they said their AEDs are end of life. So we're gonna work with them and hit our specs. And finally, at our February meeting, Mr. Bright, he's still here, mentioned fire training for current volunteers and the need for tri fi uh, fire training opportunities for our youth. I called him a few days later and talk, had a conversation with him. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna see what we can do. I called um, Mr. Felton, the chair of the Board of Education. I called the superintendent, who was you know, Barry, Dr. Barry Williams, and we had a conversation. He said, well, well let, me, let me do my work. I said, okay, so I didn't say anything, because you know how if I say something, it's gone. But anyway, finally he said something back to me um, verbally. I said, I need something in writing. So I had a, a brief conversation with Kim, I think she's gone, the finance director and the county manager, because they're working on the budget. So I had a conversation, what's the possibility of the commissioners partnering with the school system to, be, to start a, where is it? Fire Academy. Fire Academy. Yeah. A fire academy. I got it right here. And this is what most of, I mean, Dr. Barry Wim said. The Gates County School CTE Department would like to offer students an opportunity to become certified firefighters through a fire academy. Students could enroll in an introductory uh, public safety course as early as their freshman year of high school and then proceed through three levels of firef firefighter technology. Various credentials could be offered throughout each course so students are available to be hired as soon as they graduate. So, commissioners, um, I think we're going to get a proposal, a formal proposal from the school system during their budget hearing when they come, like we did with the ROTC, and we're going to um, propose, I hope, with your approval, I didn't, I didn't promise anybody anything, I just got this proposal, to fund that teach, the staff, the teacher position, just like we funded the ROTC position. That's a good collaboration for this county, it, it speaks of the future as far as training, what do you call it, grow our own. <laughs> you know, get them excited, maybe they'll stay, but if not, then they have uh, another credential in their toolkit when they graduate. So I think this is a good project for the collaboration of the commissioner, Board of Commissioners and the Board of Education, not only for the county, but for our youth, so they have another CTE uh, uh, step forward as far as what we need in this county. I thank Mr. Bright for his comments that night. I told him I was writing. He said, I saw you writing. I don't write for nothing. And I called him, and he, he educated me about firefighting. I know all about firefighting now. I'm ready to join myself. But, um, but I, I thank you for your, your leadership in this. I hope the board, when they come with the presentation, that we'll seriously uh, consider uh, funding that position so that we can have some youngsters. I'm not saying anybody's aged. I'm just saying some, some youngsters coming to the firefighting, and hopefully some females and some uh, minorities also be interested. So I just wanted to announce that tonight that finally I got what I asked for from the uh, superintendent and Mr. Felton and his board is aware. That's why I'm bringing it to the board now. Excellent. Great idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And with that, I ask for a motion to adjourn. Oh, oh my little note. <laughs> he needs to make an announcement. Move that mask. Look at it. I didn't want to be up here. Let's make that clear. 
But um, just for the sake of being transparent, I want to mention that our live stream today disconnected about 6.40 p.m. Um, our process when we do this live stream into the YouTube channel is we live stream and we locally record okay. the video as a backup. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the stream could stop, um, but from here, the only thing I can look at is internet connectivity, and we didn't lose internet connectivity. The stream just, message came up and said the live stream ended, um, so I, I have no way to troubleshoot the YouTube side of this, mm -hmm. but we are recording, so I didn't disrupt the meeting, but um, when this happens, after the meeting, we will take that recording and then post that recording to the website. Okay. So, for, so those out there in the audience and, and everybody looking at their phones, <laughs> um, it, it'll be two um, uh, video platforms. Okay. The live stream will be up there until about 6.40 or so, and, and then you'll see when it said uh, just live stream ended, and then we'll post the recording that we've locally done. Okay. So, so we'll still capture the meeting. The only thing is, is that um, the live stream folks will just have to wait until the meeting's over and, and then go back and review it. Gotcha. Um, that, that's all we can do at this point. We don't have any kind of redundant internet connections and whatnot, so no difference in a power failure that may disrupt the internet. Mm -hmm. um, going forward, if the board decides that they want to continue the live stream, then what we will have to do is stop the meeting. I'll have to make a new video platform session and then restart the meeting. Okay. Um, that'll be something I guess we can all discuss beforehand. Mm -hmm. And instead of me sitting over there raising my hand and saying, hey, uh, we, we need to take a break. No, you're fine. Right. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I, I saw some people out there looking at their phones, and uh, some people were gracious enough to let me know. But I was aware of it, but the recording was still going, so there was nothing I could do but just let the recording go, so I didn't say anything. Well, we thank you for that. I, can we put an announcement on our um, web page about the process so they'll know when they go? Yeah, I mean, we, we can say something to say okay. that if there's technical issues during the live stream, we, we try to do that as a convenience. Okay. Um, you know, we do encourage people to come to the meeting, but we want to give the convenience for both ways. But if the live stream does disconnect, our only recourse for the uh, ones who didn't attend the meeting, they'll just have to um, watch, the, wait till the meeting's over, then go back and re review the recorded session. Now, what I was saying is right now, could someone put it on our website that we had technical difficulties and to wait, whatever, whatever. If we could get that done, I don't know who does that, but it would, it would cut down on the phone calls to, to everybody, you know, what's going on. But we'll talk afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So I just want to make you, that Warren. clear. Okay. You just want to be at the microphone. We all yeah, know. Yeah, no, I did not. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Now I need a, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we all adjourn. All right. Wake Forest is leaving Towson, 38 to 21. 38 to 21, Pitt. First half of the first round.